there are various different training methods that are around, right? I'm going to break them into some real simple concepts to understand. Operant conditioning, positive reinforcement, and negative reinforcement. All the words are complicated, so I'm going to just break it down in the simplest way it can be. Um, remember before this that there's only two things every dog trainer can agree on, and that's that the third dog trainer is wrong. So you'll have people who are positive trainers, um, operant trainers, compulsion trainers, balance trainers, and everybody's going to criticize everybody. You need to find what method works for you and your dog and stick with that and forget what other people are saying. Okay? And it, just because it's called positive um, reinforcement or negative reinforcement or whatever it is, there can be a, a, a balance of all of these in your training. So I consider myself a balanced trainer and I use every single one of these methods in training. And I'll show you how. So again, remember there's critics of each method, there's, there's, there's uh, proponents of each method, but you're gonna need to find what works for you. That's all that matters. Operant conditioning relies on the dog's choice. That means the dog chooses to do something through a voluntary behavior and we mark and reward that behavior. That becomes operant. So if I sit in front of the dog and I wait and the dog sits and I say yes and I give the dog a treat or I click and give him a treat, I am now practicing operant conditioning dog training. Like dolphins, when the dolphin jumps out of the pool, I click and I give him a fish. Right? I can't force a dolphin to jump out of the water. Right? I can starve him and hope that he jumps out looking for a fish and he, he, I throw him a fish, but I can't lure the dolphin to jump. So I'm waiting for an operant conditioning. So operant conditioning oftentimes is used with animals that can't be coerced, whales, dolphins. But remember, through those methods, oftentimes those animals are greatly deprived of socialization and anything else in order to elicit behaviors that then can be marked and rewarded. So I don't consider it too positive, and sometimes I consider operant conditioning training very negative and very cruel because it will oftentimes frustrate the dog. You're not giving the dog any information. You're not luring the dog in any way. You're expecting the dog to do a behavior, and when it does the behavior you desire, you mark and reward that behavior. It can be good if a dog is offering lots of behaviors and a high drive kind of a dog because they'll offer a lot and we can mark those behaviors and we can reward those behaviors and the dog will learn that those are desired behaviors that they're getting rewarded for and will then seek to repeat them. We can then put them on cue and therefore operant conditioning training will be very beneficial. But when the dog is not getting it and I'm waiting and not giving him even a simple yes or a no cue or, you know, like a Marco Polo where the, the dog at least knows where he should be. You guys know the game Marco Polo, like in a swimming pool, you Marco Polo, so you can kind of find the person. But if you're playing Marco Polo and nobody, and you go, Marco, and there's no polo, you don't know where anybody is because you're blindfolded. So in essence, operant conditioning is Marco Polo without the, per the other person yelling polo. You're waiting for a behavior, you're marking a behavior, and you're uh, reinforcing by rewarding that behavior. That's the basic premise to operant conditioning. There's no negative and there's no positive. It's operant. It deals with the dog's choice. Positive reinforcement training is anything which, when the dog associates it with that particular act, it will cause it to repeat the act. So in other words, um, I can the dog sits and I give it a treat, it's positive. It's a positive reinforcement. That can come through operant conditioning. So if the dog sits on his own, I mark it. So now I've infused positive reinforcement into the operant conditioning. However, with positive reinforcement, I can also lure and shape a behavior that I want the dog to do. I can take a treat and I can hold it between his paws and, be, and watch him by the time he starts to crouch down and lay down, and when he lays all the way down, I give him the treat and I mark it with a yes, I've lured and shaped a positively reinforced behavior and taught the dog exactly what I want him to do by helping him along the lines, not waiting for him to figure it out. My favorite method of training is positive reinforcement because it gives the dog some information. I like it, I'm luring him into a position, and then I'm reinforcing and rewarding it with a verbal and, and a reward. Um, 
praise is positive reinforcement, treats are positive reinforcement, toys are positive reinforcements, all those are positive reinforcement because the dog's drive is satisfied with something he desires, which is the treat, the, the reward, the praise, or the toy. Um, like I said, positive training um, allows me to lure and shape a behavior where operant conditioning requires me to wait for the dog to perform the action and it allows me or, or asks me to mark that behavior. So, um, negative reinforcement training is anything which when the dog associates it with a particular act, it will cause the dog to avoid the act, okay? A real radical example would be a dog puts his paws on the counter and I take a stick and I whack his paws with a stick and the dog goes, whoa, that was horrible, I'm not gonna ever put my paws on the counter again. We should never hit dogs. We should never use a, a tool like that. We should never do that to the dog, right? I'm just giving you an example that now when the dog goes to put his paws up there, he's like, no way, I'm, last time I put my paws up there, I got my fingers whacked, right? Not only will it not uh, let the dog put his, or uh, desire to put his fingers up there, but he's gonna just hate you because you're gonna be the jerk that whacked him. So you're destroying the relationship between you and the dog by doing negative reinforcement in that fashion. But I'm gonna give you an example of where negative reinforcement is very positive and very beneficial, okay? One is a dog that bolts out your door and you live on a busy street, okay? There's no way to positively reinforce the dog not to run out the door and run into the street, right? I can't positively do that because his desire to run out is not gonna do that, but I can negatively reinforce it. So to negatively re reinforce that, I would put a line on the dog, pinch collar, could be an e-collar, long line. And when the dog is running towards that door, I would hang onto that line. And personally, I would allow the dog to run and get to the end of that line and close line themselves, which would be negative. It would be very aversive. It would startle the dog. It may even cause discomfort or displeasure. And when the dog turns back towards me, I would praise him, right? So he would see the action of going through that door would be negative. It's negatively reinforced because next time he runs to that door, he's going to go, oh my God, last time I ran over there, I got, I got yanked back. I got clotheslined. And that would keep your dog from running out your door into the street and getting killed by a car. So it's the lesser of the two evils, right? I mean, better to use a positive reinforcement when the dog gets to the door, I tell him to sit, I give him a treat, and then I let him go through the door. That's the first way I would practice that. But if that doesn't work, there's no way to positively reinforce the correction of him, of what I don't want him to do, right? Real simple to understand that. Is that clear? So negative reinforcement in another fashion, okay? If you think of rattlesnake avoidance training with dogs, right? A, tr a rattlesnake will stimulate the dog's sense of sight, sound, and smell incredibly stimulating to the dog. How do I get the dog to not go after that rattlesnake? Because that rattlesnake will kill him, right? Simple, I put an electric collar on the dog, I let the dog wander near the rattlesnake, and when he gets near that rattlesnake, I, I push that button and I give him one hell of a shock. And that shock will scare him to pieces. And that fear will keep, well, he will associate that fear with that rattlesnake. And that fear will keep him from wanting to go near that rattlesnake. And if that correction isn't hard enough and it just kind of irritates the dog, you'll see a dog that will go up to a rattlesnake and bark at the rattlesnake and bark at the rattlesnake and bark at the rattlesnake and that will kill the dog. Because barking at the rattlesnake is challenging the rattlesnake and the rattlesnake will, will strike out and bite him. But if he's so afraid of that rattlesnake through the correction, through the negative reinforcement that he doesn't want to go anywhere near that rattlesnake, that will save his life. So in negative reinforcement training, it's a good way to teach the dog life-saving skills that will help him stay alive. It's not necessarily a good way to teach a dog how to sit, right? And there's a lot of old school trainers who would put a pinch collar on a dog and do a forced sit where they would yank the dog and the dog would be in great pain and the dog would be trying to figure out what to do and the dog would put his butt down and then they would release the pressure or to do a forced fetch, a forced retrieve with the dog where they put a dog and put a pinch collar on the dog and put pressure, pressure, pressure on the dog and make the dog take the dumbbell and then release the pressure when the dog has the dumbbell. So the dog would associate negatively with letting go of the dumbbell, positively with holding the dumbbell. 
they're old school, they're, they're archaic training methods, right? They don't need to be used anymore. We can do a lot more with positive motivation and inspire dogs to do the right thing. That's how we should be training. But when it comes to life or death, that's when we got to step it up and make sure we don't take these tools out of here because they can keep a dog alive, right? And if you like this video, you're going to love this channel. Subscribe, um, like this video, and uh, watch these videos in this playlist up here.